Great, 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 great. Well, we're back here at Circle Healing Network. Um, today's show, we are going to kind of uh, yin and yang back and forth, I believe, is what's going to happen because Barry and I have had some interesting conversations. But my guest today, once again, is Mr. Barry Littleton. And uh, he was on the show a few weeks back um, for the first time sharing um, his experiences, uh, being an experiencer on, uh, from the time he was a, a young, a, a young kid. And, um, and, and so you guys were able to get a piece of him that way. If you haven't, please go back and look at the earlier show, catch up on it. Barry has been interviewed by a number of different um, people. He's on different shows. He has his own channel as well that he's putting up material. So please, um, when you want to catch up with Barry, just put Barry Littleton into the YouTube search thing and some of his things will come up. Um, but I wanted to come back today because one of the things that I really enjoyed when you and I talked the last time, Barry. So th first of all, Barry, thanks a lot for coming to get on the show. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure yeah. to be back here. You know, like I said, yeah. we, we made us my sister, same, spelled the same, so we're very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely we are, I tell you. Um, and it's interesting because every when I first saw you, as I said before, when you were on Kelly's show, I could just tell that there was a lot going on behind your going on up in your mind, and it wasn't all getting out because I know you guys were talking about some other topics. But you would throw different te different teachings in, different readings in. And I'm like, oh, this brother, he really is. Uh, he can go deep on you, you know. And so then when you came on the show, we did a little talking and some sharing and stuff. And you and I've talked off line as well. And I just felt that Barry, you bring a lot to the table with not only having been um, you know, we can use the word awake, you know, at a very early age, I think you, you just never were asleep. You just came into this existence already, um, doing what you were coming here to do. And you were one of the fortunate people who remembered it early on and were able to, um, to bring a balance to it and to respect what was happening in your life. I mean, it's not always easy, but you were, you know, Team Barry, you know this is this is what I this is what I carved out for this time around. So um, I think that's huge. And one of the things that has concerned me, and one of the reasons why I even started Circle Healing Network, is because I remember when I was young, and I, I it's always attributed, I think, to Frederick Douglass. But my grandmother used to always say, "Robin, if you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem." She used to always say that. And I remember that for me, it just meant that. You know, if you're not doing something to help, just because you're sitting back and you're not doing anything against, you're not doing anything to help either. And so you really are kind of part of the problem. And so to me, this network is about being part of the solution and, and just trying to bring up topics and bring people on the show and just give them free reign. I mean, everything that we discuss on some of these shows are not my personal opinions or, you know, I don't necessarily resonate with everything that's being said. But I think that the people, I do try to bring people on that are in their hearts trying to do the right thing. They're trying to put the right information out. And where I don't think the information is harmful, who knows? Someone needs to hear that maybe because that's where their orientation is right now in order to flip and move into another uh, place of being um, comfortable with their spiritual development. So I hit Barry up last week and I said, hey, Barry, you know, we talked a little bit about Castaneda the last time around. Um, can we go back there, you know? And, you know, what was hitting me about Carlos Castaneda is that, you know, he came around in the early 60s. You know, he was at UCLA, you know, um, studying, uh, what was it, um, field archaeology or something like that. I mean, he would take in some of those kind of classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe uh, medicinal planets, plants. <laughs> So right, medicinal plants and what have you. And so he was he was into that, trying to see what that was all about. So he was going to, and interestingly what happened, Barry, I read something when I was getting ready for this show. And basically the reason why he even kind of got off in the medicinal plants and went into the natives, um, you know, finding some old the elders in the Native American culture and starting to talk to them because his teacher, he was studying field archaeology, this particular class, and his teacher said, if you go and interview natives, you automatically get an A on your paper. So this is UCLA. Who ain't going to go do that? So I thought that was interesting 
point by which he even kind of like that wasn't necessarily a genuine interest of his, but it was it sort of made sense educationally, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the thing about Castaneda, and we'll get more into the detail on that, but the thing that really hit me was that he came along at a time when you was free love, you know, the cultures were changing, people were coming out of the youth were coming out of the bondage of the 50s and the 40s and the 30s and out of the war years and all that stuff. And people wanted free love, free choice, you know, free sex, free, you know? <laughs> and, free sex, yeah, yeah, I yeah free that. everything, just free, damn it. And so um, people were starting to go, you know, deeper spiritually, looking at, you know, what's life all about, what's the cosmos, it was, you know, the fifth dimension, the age of Aquarius. All this stuff was going on, and so the work that he did with Don Juan and the medicinal plants and peyote and what is it, Daptura and what have you, um, and being able to go off and do pretty much like with mushrooms and you know things like that are doing um, these days that people are doing it, opened up this fantasy world that people were like, wow, you know, that's really what's going on, you know, and so people connected at a time that I think they needed a new hero. They needed a new somebody that was gonna kind of like, kind of go out there in those dimensions and kind of champion the, the way for them so that they could try it, you know, cause it's drugs and it's, it's free everything, you know? And I think to me, and I could be wrong, this is just my opinion. That was a part of the appeal of, Carl, of, of Castaneda, you know, and his work with, with uh, medicinal plants and Don Juan and all that stuff. However, and, and we'll talk more about that the parallel for me was, wow, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, however long it's been, we're like right back there again. You know, we're here, a big shift is coming. Everybody wants to be free. You're tired of the government confining you. You're tired of being chained to these jobs. You're tired of paying for ridiculous prices for electricity. And I mean, you know, we all just want to be free. We want to get, you know, the, the talking heads, mainstream media. <laughs> All this stuff, people are tired. People are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I think people are back out there looking for solutions. And I and, and a big, huge solution is on the horizon. We're definitely moving, you know, fourth to fifth dimension. You know, things are happening on the planet um, and off planet. And, you know, we're all really going to that. Our DNA is actually upgrading. We're going to that next level of humanity. You know, and I think we all are sensing this jumping off. My concern, like Castaneda's work, is for people to become aware, and like you were talking about, um, become immortal soul beings, recognize, you know, our immortal soul being, and taking responsibility, and don't fall for all this crap that's going on out there. Every time you turn on a YouTube channel or something, somebody is, is taking something out of your head, putting something in your head. Um, they've been to a Stargate. They've been through a Stargate. They've been to Mars. They haven't been to Mars. They've been here. They've seen the tall people. They haven't seen the short people. I mean, and some of this stuff, not to say that some, that this, this dimensional stuff is going on. Yeah. But they don't have any more of a way to recognize what's going on in their world for you than you have for yourself. And it's back to personal responsibility because what did it take 30 years for the, um, what was it? 20 something years for the informant? on Castaneda to be written? It was like in the, in the 90s? Was it like the like mid-90s? His, uh, his last book, I believe, just before he passed, right? Right. Well, his, his wife ended up writing the pivotal book that explained the whole thing of how he wrote the paper and everything and, and made the timeline more clear with regards to he had wrote the paper but claimed that all that information he had gotten from being with Don Juan a year later had actually happened from him going out and hooking up with some of the with some of the um with, with the one guy who wasn't even a native he was a caucasian american because he didn't fit the role of the native indian he had to make the don juan be the person who gave up the information this time around so i mean a lot of it was fabricated and a lot of it in a lot of ways probably wasn't even true but a whole culture hung on this and I think there's a bit of that going on now. So I just want to set the tone for the show um, because the whole point of this show and for the audience 
is for us to stir up some thinking. Um, Barry, it, it, he can go real deep and far and wide on this, but for us to really just start taking personal responsibility and don't pay for people to over the internet give you a Skype session to read your freaking aura or to help you disconnect from some soul being somewhere. I mean, you can do this yourself. This is ridiculous at a point. So Barry, I'm sorry, take it away, man. You know. <laughs> I think what um casting that, I think we should definitely touch on that real quick because it's such a vital, really part of I think. Um would you like to start from the positivity of positive aspect of the negative? Yeah, let's start from the positive and then yeah, bring out so people can start seeing the ele the evolution of that culture. Well, I'll tell you what, I got introduced to his work when I was about 13 or 14, all right? Read all of his work, including those that are considered to be the warriors of his party, all right, the ladies. Um, the thing about him is this, I will say his, concerning what you had addressed as well, his first three books are the good ones. The first one is a little bit more how he got connected with the culture, all right? The second one and the third one, um, a separate uh, a journey to Ixlin, a separate reality and a journey to Ixlin. A journey to Ixlin is his best piece of work, all right? At a certain point, I think he started getting taken by um, these, as he calls them, chakmuls, or they're called uh, witches to a certain degree, Florinda mm -hmm. Donner and uh, Marilyn Tunashindi and Tasha Ablar and all of them. They have works, too that described the same, the same warrior's party, Don Juan Mattis, who was his master, all right, his teacher, all right? Mm -hmm. And they worked, they worked with him too, but he's under a different name by them. You know, right. what I mean? we're dealing yeah. with controlled folly. So in that way, when dealing with his work, all right, you know, the, the um, what, what I'll say when I really talk about it, the thing about this, I read all his work, and I will say this, when people start say, really dogging out everything he did, especially in the first three books, he gives a lot of techniques in there. Yes. You might say, well, did you try any of the techniques he offered? Like, no. Well, I, I did. And certain of them yield paranormal results here in the third dimension almost immediately. Now, mm -hmm. if everything he's saying is fake, why do some of his techniques actually work? Right. They, yeah. That, 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 that is a major point. But most people will try things if they don't work the first or second time, they move on. We're too busy living our normal life to try to do these spiritual exercises too much. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. in fact, to to your point, the piece of the material that was written by that was called The Informant and Castaneda was actually written by mm -hmm. the nephew of the guy who was actually the real Don Juan who was out of New Mexico, out of Taos area, and Castaneda had actually just run up, had tripped upon him on one of his trips, and this guy just had imparted a lot of the medicinal information, because he had been doing this, um, learning about it from the natives, but he wasn't native, he was um, American. He wasn't even native, but um, he was an artist. And so the, so the, the basis, which is what, Castaneda wrote in his paper that he had turned in in UCLA the summer before he started working on the, his first Castaneda book. So yeah, the meat of that anthropology was factual and real stuff. He just didn't attribute it to the right person, yeah. but so go ahead. You know, then, then he starts getting into Toltec ways and ancient shaman, shamanism. And that you know that's where I think a lot of his greatest material is. And okay. after, after Journey to Ixlin, there be, there are pieces in each book, but I mean it's not the whole body of work like the first three. Definitely, I would say. But there's certain aspects he brings up, like the aspects of dreamers and stalkers. Sure. That's a big one, okay? The attention, uh, the assemblage point, and I've heard about the assemblage point before, you know, which is act actually our point of perception on our luminous cocoon. <clears throat> you know, I hear a lot of people, what color is my aura? What color is this and that? And you know, and then, honestly, for some of us that see, that can really see, uh -huh. the, the human energy field doesn't look like that. That's what new age is telling us. That's what certain gurus said, but not mm -hmm. all of us see like that. Just like I can tell you that the overall form of a person is not these aura col colors, 
it's more like a mushroom. The energy field around a person, it's like a, it's like an, it, the energy field is shaped like a mushroom a little bit more. Gotcha. Not totally, but I mean, it's, it's like a crossing a spherical and oval. But it's not right. the way he described on so many of these books and so many of these energy print, prints and all these things I'm seeing. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean, yes. Yeah, so in that way, so when he uh, addresses things like that, and I'll tell you, something else that's very, very interesting about him. When you get to the end of his series, you'll know there was two teachers he dealt with and also was a whole party of, of other men that were being trained with him, all right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> he talks about a gentleman named Don Hanero. Don right. Hanero to scare the hell out of him, all right? And often caused him to uh, excrement on himself and lose control of his bowels. And these guys, these, these Indian cats is laughing at him, you know, saying how Caucasian he was, how he couldn't seem to see at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then, Don Hanero had a habit of making him lose body of his, his bodily functions because he was defying gravity all the time. And he would describe these gentlemen showing up sometimes. It looked like they were being mischievous. They had this certain light in their eyes. It was different. And they mm -hmm. seemed vibrant. All right. What he didn't understand is these are master dreamers that are showing up to him in their dream bodies. And mm -hmm. the dream bodies can be as corporeal as the physical body to a certain degree, at least for our senses. We have cognitive dissonance. So we see something, we try to use a frame of reference. And right. being that can project itself looking like it normally would. But guess what? The dream body is not confined to gravity, shape, a lot of the things that the physical laws, our physical bodies are. So when these guys are showing up in their dream bodies, he can't see, he can't see them as an energy, of, a ball of energy. So they begin form, performing things only the dream body can do. And he can't take it. It's about to give him a nervous breakdown. Right. So, right. <laughs> and and they he gets a lot of laughter from him. Those guys are slapping their knees. Oh, oh. like when they brought him some, they brought him some mushrooms, he tried to eat some mushrooms with him. And they brought a whole big bat, a whole big uh, trash bag of it. And he said, what? They said, what, he started to eat an eighth? And they started laughing at him, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. You know? It reminds me of that one where he, um, where he, um, had gone, had eaten the mushrooms, or had, had, no, he had actually smoked, when the, uh, Don Juan was teaching him how to smoke the pipe, how to have, to have the respect for the smoke. Yeah, and he ended yeah. up being a dog. He was like a dog for hours. He's running around and playing with the dogs and eating, eating and drinking out the dog bowls and stuff. Like when he comes to, they're all laughing at him. Like they're just uh -huh. like, it's, mm -hmm. you know. It was a dog. It was an inorganic being. Right. And he thinks it's a dog. In fact, it was the, the being of mescu masculine, I believe. Was that? It was masculine. Oh, was masculine. Yeah, was yeah. yeah. Either way, it was the spirit of that of that of that drug of that earth drug, you know. And that's it's very interesting. His his accounts are very interesting. You know, like I give you an example. Like anyone who's listening, if I want to throw out two techniques he give that actually works, one of them is called the gate of power. I do believe that's in the journey of Ixlan, and okay. it's a very bizarre technique that most people read it and say. Hell, I'm not trying that. I went and tried it a bunch of times. And you know what? It does something. At least it did for me. It shows wow. you shut down your internal dialogue for one thing, but I didn't know at the time that's what it's supposed to do. It, it does what? It does what? It shuts down your internal dialogue, stops you it from cuts, It cuts it down, you said? Yeah, it stops it a little bit. And, stops oh. it. and you know, <clears throat> when, I, when I correlate what he called the gate of power with something I learned about when I was younger, I was very entrenched, entrenched with, which was the Great Walkers. Do you remember the Great Walkers? No, I don't. They're like the, the, the Indians that walked across the Bering Strait. Like, oh, okay, oh, yeah. Bro, no one knows how they did it. Right, it's, I remember hearing about that. Okay, got you. Uh -huh. power, same type of technique. And those are things that were passed down from the, the ancients, you know, as far as like the first cycle. And having past life memories, I remember a first cycle, even before that. And some of the right. men that evolved from the first cycle or terrifying almost wizards to a degree right 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 dark practitioners and some of those techniques still go on now i have um some friends now that i know have been trained in some techniques that we could call certain tribes native american tribes and even some that i've got blood myself but it um some of the techniques are dark not in terms that they're evil but right. they're not loving techniques. They're not coming from the heart chakra. 
So right. it's like the difference from that same era. You had a couple of gurus. I used to check them out too. You know, like the, yeah. the work of the work of good old the first one. I, first guru I got introduced to was Bhagwan Shali Rajneesh. You remember old Raj? Yeah, yeah, I do. Great technique when he started doing the orangey thing and try to poison people and whatever else. You know, he, right, he, right, right. Yeah, he was coming from the throat chakra. All yeah. his techniques, whether they're mm -hmm. gazing techniques or uh, they're all coming from the heart, the throat chakra. Okay. Gotcha. Then I yeah. then I get introduced to Pramahatsa Yogananda. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're coming more from the heart chakra. Okay? Right, right. They're talking more like that. Don Juan was or uh, um, Bhagwan was more the throat and the root chakra. A lot of root chakra there. You know. Right. A lot of root chakra. This level, so. Anyway, sorry, I may be getting too far off the subject. No, no, I'm, I'm loving it. No, this is, I mean, the, the people, you know, we, we got an audience for this. People are getting, you know, because this is, the, the you know, the point of us, you know, and I appreciate you breaking down Castaneda for, because, you know, I don't know how many people listen to this have taken the time to read it. But, I mean, it is pivotal work uh, moving into this whole, so -called, the new age and the 60s and all that. A lot of, a lot of what, I, th I feel like the remnants of what is going on right now started back then mm -hmm. and what people are doing are pale in comparison to what was really going on you know and so i mean this is a sense for people to kind of understand like you know the, some of the history of this and um how to find themselves in and out of this maze that's been created now mm -hmm. so yeah keep on going with that yeah, what was well, the second one? You said one was the gate of power. What was the second technique hmm, of Castaneda? I don't know. I should even mention that. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> Come on. it's similar to what, what people call now scrying. Scrying with mirrors. Scribe? Scrying. S-C-R-Y-I-N-G. Scrying. Okay. You ever heard of that? That's a that's a deal like um like even in that that Barnum uh PT Barnum collection that guy has. There's a black mirror that's part of that that museum that moves around that mobile museum. Or yeah, uh -huh. it's a black mirror that people have had just horrible experiences with. But that's a scrying mirror, all right. Oh, this technique is a little different. It involves constructing a frame around a mirror, okay. And really, what you're doing then is learning how you're putting your intent of will into it when you're making that frame. If you're someone that doesn't know how to project your will into something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you make that frame, <laughs> and then you go you go to a stream or a river of some type, all right, a natural one, and you anchor in the shallow part. You anchor this mirror down inside the water, okay? Uh huh. And then you start doing what's called a looking technique or a gazing technique, and that again crosses over into kind of what the gurus were talking about and the kriya system of uh, of Hindu the, that kind of crosses into that. But a gazing right. technique is a way of actually looking at something. You know, um, so much energy goes through our eyes, our physical mm -hmm. eyes. That's the most active part of our physical bodies. So much energy. <laughs> so when you still the physical eyes, that great energy has to find another pathway. Immediately, that next pathway is the third eye, the pineal gotcha. gland. So this, gotcha. Yeah, this is a way of using your pineal gland to look into this mirror. And what you'll find is that beings will come to the to the mirror. Okay, that's like a knock on the door for beings that are called from the levels of fluidity. Okay, <laughs> and we're dealing with awareness and consciousness, but it's not the way we think. Almost like a Star Trek called fluidic space. <laughs> right, right, right. Four, seven two that beat down the board. Anyway, sorry, I'm going. I'm going. No, that's okay. You get you get the opportunity to do that. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody say, "Oh my God, that brother's some sort of Star Trek fool." Anyway. We already know that, but that's all good. There's plenty of us out here, so you know you're gonna find. You know, <laughs> I've been attacked you know. for that. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> but um, these beings will come to make sure you bless the technique before you try it, because these inorganic beings will come. That's a knock on the door for these beings. They come and look. You know what I mean? Right. And if you don't know what you're doing, they'll try to start coming through that mirror. And it's not going to be the shocking force. You might feel something, but they'll come through that mirror, and then they can't get back. So guess what? They start following you around. They got you. And so let's look to your so life. Can can you can for the audience, can you show a parallel? Can you point to a parallel of how that's being how that's being done or going on right now 
in some people with YouTube channels and these writing these books. I mean, there's parallels there that people might want to pay attention to. Well, you know, that, that, that goes back to Castaneda again. You know, <clears throat> his later works, he came into contact with the, who were called the women warriors of the party that were being trained by the same people. And some of them were some of Don Juan's um, cohorts, cohorts, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they pretty much enslaved him. I think it's called, oh, it's the one after Journey to Ixland. It's where he meets, the lady's name is Donna Soldad. And wow. she basically, he tried, he tried to have sex with him. He's a pervert. You can see the way he died. He, yeah, that, that's right his whole life. But anyway, right. she tried to kill him, basically. All right? right. He was enslaved by them. And there was a thing called the Tens Garrity movement that he was doing with Florinda Donner Grau and Tasha and a few others of them. And it's these movements that are supposed to solidify the dream body, solidify the energy body. <laughs> what I've been told is that those are negative exercises that are actually channeling your personal energy to these witches. Wow. And he yeah. was enslaved. And he kind of had a miserable death. He did. Right. He didn't die like the guy that got pushed off the cliff and it had to fly there. You know, that, 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 is, that isn't how he went out at all. Okay? Right, right. And I've, I've heard other people come up concerning him, like there's another gentleman named um, Thunderstrikes. Thunderstrikes was part of what's called the Twisted Hairs, which is a different type of shaman. And uh, I can't tell you a lot about it. I'm no expert in it. But he did a show right. with Art Bell. Anyone can look that up on YouTube. Uh, Art Bell, Coast to Coast, and Thunder wow. Strikes over shadow people. He came on there to talk about the shadow people. Okay. And he spoke a lot about Castaneda, about Don Juan Mattis, and about Don Juan Hinero. He claimed he knew, knew them both before they depart, departed. But many people have stepped forward like that now, saying they knew who these individuals, individuals really were. But I think the most thing is the techniques that are presented in his material. And if you go through his whole series, there's several of them, you know, that are things that are definitely vital for, I think, a warrior to know, especially right. when starts talking about the death process. That's right. a serious one there, a very serious one. Well, it also kind of, it, it also kind of, you know, when you were talking about if you're not careful, um, you know, with these techniques, um, <laughs> you know, being to come through and then they, they can't get back through, so now they're following you around. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, like, at least when I was reading Castaneda and um, people of his elk, um, when they were experimenting with peyote and mescaline and, and detour and what have you, you pretty much knew that you were going down a particular path, that you were electing to try these substances and try to recreate some of these kind of etheric, spiritual, mm -hmm. going into altered dimension experiences. Mm -hmm. You pretty much knew, um, like when you think about, what was his name? Um, God, what was his name? God, Don, I mean, uh, it's a big, he's still alive. He lives in Hawaii um, now. Miguel Ruiz, that guy? No, Boss, Goss. Uh, it's like an Indian name. Uh, he, he adopted the name. He was up in Woodstock, and they were doing all the. He was doing a lot of the experimental drug stuff. Tara McKenna. It'll come to, McKenna? It'll come to me. Um, Timothy Leary. Uh uh, it's a name. It's an easy. It's like a quick name, like like Don Juan, but it's like oh. it's, it's, it's something Voss or or it'll come to me. But um, Oprah interviewed him a couple of years back now. But um, anyway, you knew that you were you knew that you were going down that path of experimenting. So you were kind of like consciously signing on to whatever was happening. If, enti if entities end up following you around or you kind of got stuck in time or if your brain kind of fried on you a little bit, you had signed up for it. But nowadays what's going on is that everybody's got this technique that if you, if you pay them $110 or $444 or $111, all these freaking magic number things, which I don't get. You'll get some kind of quantum healing from them. And um, you're opening yourself for them to do this over a Skype session or, you know, etherically through the air. 
And people are having a lot of beings attached to them. They're having a lot of unwanted beings that end up attaching through these processes that they're not signing up for, which in effect, they kind of walk away with some of the same stuff, but it's more, it's more passive because they don't realize that this is what they're, this is what's ultimately happening, but this is not their intention. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll say, um, you know, right now, implant removal and the implant thing, that's a big fad. It's a huge it's fad. Like organite. Organite is a big fad right now. Yes. Yes. People sitting around pieces that do nothing. All right. Name one, you, you I mean you, you cover the, the, the what's the gathering the organite, the orgone, you cover it with things that are insulated. It, it's not emanating outwards. Okay. Right. So that's coming from me, somebody that as a teenager started building cloud busters and really trying to do that stuff for real. Like right. Wilhelm Reich and uh, the Bion research and then the Trevor Constable's work and stuff like that, you know? And mm -hmm. that, there's a certain amount of doing those machines is very dangerous. It's a thing that like anybody has a cloud buster, they, that water in there that actually accumulates the energy, the orgone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In this cloud, it creates something called DOR, which is deadly orgone radiation. And that's essentially what holds Nimbus clouds together, all right? But guess right. what? That starts building up in your machines like a residual, and you have other beings that come to feed on that. Right. You actually photograph them in the infrared spectrum with an ultraviolet uh, filter. You start taking yeah. pictures like I did around my cloud buster, and you start seeing these weird things around there. I was like, my God, you know, but they're coming and feeding on that negative energy. So it's the same beings, the same predators that feed on our negative emotions that are coming through people creating circumstances, trying constantly to create a negative morphogenic field, the, like Yoda called him the force. What is the force? It's everything. It emanates right. everything and from all living things. Same basic deal with the morphogenic field, all right? And yeah, for us, exactly. I've, said, I've said this on a lot of these interviews. You know, we're fools to think that in our concrete jungles, we have no natural predators if we're not out in the wilderness. But we have them. They're just slightly beyond mortal vision. You know? Right. Yeah. And, so exactly. that, and that, that's my point. I mean, to my point, that is exactly what I'm saying. And, you know, people who are listening to this show, um, I mean, you know, the, the point of this is to really get that is that, um, you know, you don't want to open yourself up. I mean, like people, oh, the latest thing is making GANs, GANs, GANs this, GANs that. All you have to do is put the copper with the this and the make this. I mean, you're making a material that will kill you. If you know, if you if you come in contact with it, it's, you know, it's it's a very low and bad form of ormus, but you have in it that the same beings that you're talking about feed upon. So you're making the very thing that you really don't want. I don't really think your intention is to have this in your world. And then how do you get rid of this stuff? Most people don't know that you got to alkalize it and try to break it back down so that you just can't throw that down. The system you've created, or you've created a organic being that now will continue to live. <laughs> in the I'll, say, I'll, I'll say something that I think is very real needs to be addressed, and it's not addressed enough. You know, when I when I was much younger, you know, uh, to like teenager, my main thing was I was trying to get the astral projection. I was trying to have the OB. You know what I mean? Right. I couldn't, despite all the experiences I was having and stuff, I couldn't seem to astral project. I mean, I tried everything. I tried. Kriya system, I tried pranayama, I tried that bull crap Paul Twitchell Ekinkar, I tried everything trying to get a, a, an astral body projection, okay? And I couldn't seem to do it. It was, you know, very, very frustrating, you know? I even started, uh -huh. I started changing my diet to much more of a vegetarian type of diet, all right? Right. Then seeing energy fields around people, all right? More than I had seen before. More right. different, you know what I mean, in form and structure and stuff. But uh, next, immediately next, came the shadows. I could start seeing these shadows out of my peripheral vision. And most people don't understand with the cones and rods of the eye, actually, yep. the peripheral vision is in black and white. And that's why we can often see spirits out of the peripheral vision. You know, exactly. and we look on head on, you know. Anyway, I started seeing these shadows, and there were two types of them. One that were smaller, um, spherical shadows, very flitting, very quick. Right, like almost like a like a a, a light almost kind of sort of quick. 
Yeah, they're they're like, quick. Yeah, like they're, a pulse almost. You know, evil moves around a lot, though. You know, anyway, but <laughs> there's <laughs> others that were more like oval almost that were bigger. Okay. okay. At a certain time, I could start seeing them like hovering places, several them together, only out of my peripheral. And, you know, and then um, one day I'm working at this bowling alley I worked at through high school and college. Mm -hmm. uh, after hours, we could, the employees could go down there and bowl. Most of them were bowlers. The bartender's down there bowling, you know. I mean, right. get a turkey, man. She's tearing it up. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I see one of these shadows goes by me, and it's a bigger one, an obvious one. At this oval one, at this time, I'm getting a little better at tracking them with my vision, you know. And right. So this thing it goes down and it, it, there's hardly anybody in there it attaches to the bartender it gets on her crown chakra oh my goodness elongates down to about her root chakra and it starts turning a funny gray like phasing in and out mm. so then she's about to get another turkey i mean she's getting strikes that, oh i go down i say you're all right you know and she's telling me you know i don't know barry i think i'm just thinking stinking stinking thinking is getting to me and she's about to get a divorce. The divorce is coming, more or less. So, man, so right. I could see then this shadow was feeding on her. It's right. a predator. And it's feeding on those emotions she's generating. So before right. I, I pray for the prime creator to take me away from that vibration, not even to be able to see it, you know what right. I mean? <laughs> <laughs> not my thing, you know? But not I, my thing. I'm, I'm with you there, buddy. Yeah, I started noticing that the people that were really loving and kind of good people, I didn't see those shadows around them. You know right. What I mean? That's not a palatable energy source for them, a food source for them. Right. But what you've got is these beings that are coming through people we love. They're creating circumstances in our lives that are usually financial related that creates things to stress us out, to keep us from generating a lo more loving vibration. They're constantly doing that, and they attach you. They attack you in your dreams. I love that. That is odd. That is what yeah. I mean. That's that's fresh. I haven't heard it explained like that, but I mean, I think I, I can grasp that. I can yeah, see that. Know, happen. Well, think about it. if you start passing through the gates of dreaming, you'll notice something. There's something you can start isolating. The you'll realize really people that have dream attention and can sustain that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Then really, you're standing in the middle of an imp electron impulse and a bunch of phasmatonic phasmatonical uh, images, images, right? You've got other beings that are in your field of awareness, whether they be immortal soul beings like us or not, they're in our right. field of awareness and they're jumping in our field of awareness all the time here on earth. And we're so locked out, taking care of our kids, paying our bills that we can't perceive them half the time. People, right. might, people might see, Oh, I saw orb or oh, I saw a flash or I heard the wind chimes. But they're not realizing other other beings are jumping in their field of awareness. But when you're asleep, you're halfway with them. And the more predatorial ones will show up as people you know and love. And you, we've all had dreams. Somebody comes up, your mom comes up, and she's just tearing your ass up. Sorry, tearing your butt up, you know? Yeah. And you don't know why. You know, well, why are you doing that? You know, why are you treating me like that? But they're getting those emotions going. They're feeding right you know i hear a lot of people robin right now saying that oh i fought this being oh they're no big deal just shoot some light at them and they'll be gone you know what i mean mm -hmm. and you know, that might be so for some of these little spherical shadows i just talked about that are too scared to even be seen head on okay right, That's, right. we can blast them easy with just mental thoughts and things like that that is not the same as when one of those higher beings comes, a real fallen one, or one that right. was actually created from that vibration, when right. it comes into your field of awareness and it tells you, I hate you, I'm going to consume your awareness, your glow of awareness. And they project that type of hate at you that you never felt before, you're in for the battle of your life. It's not gonna be some, oh, I just wished them away. You're in for the battle of your life. So and a lot see, of people are saying that, talking like they just dealt with all these dark spirits. And, and they don't, and they can't, and it's all, it's all, it's, it, you know, it's all conversation. But the problem with that is that it all sounds good to, yeah, let's surround them in light and love. Um, let's, you know, this and let's, okay, those are, those are solutions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those are solutions. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But, they're not a solution that's available to people 
who are walking around in fear 90% of their time and who are exposing themselves to fear material that keeps them oscillating at a, a lower vibration. So every time, don't think you're going to sit down and look at some horror show or CI, see whatever those different programs are and all this stuff. And then you're going to get up from that show and be light and love. You don't think any of those beings have attached themselves to you. Mm -hmm. They are actually being created. Those shows are being created by these beings, by the, the, the larger, more in control, more powerful ones that are causing these feeding systems. And so it goes back to like they say, you know, the Hindus talk about it a lot. You have to protect your eye, your ear gates. These gates have got, these are gateways. They've got to be protected. And what you allow to come in is going to be magnified and you attract these things. And this is the thing that gets me about a lot of, you know, and I don't, I mean, I don't have anything. There's a lot of great people out here pushing this movement. There's a lot of people who really have their heart in the right place. And they really are wanting to be a part of elevating what's going on in this planet. With good intentions, right? With good intentions, including myself. Rose I don't get it right all the time. Made with good intentions. Sorry, just want to throw that in. Right. No, exactly. Uh, who said that? Lauren Hill or someone? Or was that, what's that song from? I don't know. But somebody um, got some experience. I think that Pathway, Pathway to Hell is, is, what did you just say? Is that what you just said? No, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said oh, I said, the road to hell is paved with good Right, intentions. exactly, with good intentions, exactly. <laughs> and so it, it, that's to my point. And so what happens is that what you're saying is that unless people truly start looking at every aspect of their life and start really getting serious across the board, you can't, I mean, I don't have anything, I mean, I'm a vegetarian. I don't, I never did like eating meat. I understand people still eat meat, but at least try to eat meat that if you're going to eat meat, be mindful of the fact that animals for the most part are being slaughtered, killed with fear. They're, they're, they're dying slow deaths. I mean, all this stuff, all this is locking in the meat, but these beings that you're talking about are feeding on this stuff mm -hmm. and you feed on it. And you expect they're not going to feed on you too. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so. And yeah, and, and you know, it, it ties into something else too. Everyone needs to be aware of this, that most of these beings, the way for them to really gain access to our waking world, our conscious third dimensional world, for them to manifest, uh -huh. they start as negative thought forms in our own minds. And they start, we start thinking that for whatever influence it is or stimuli that causes it, we start thinking of this, you know, alien abduction, whatever, it starts building negative thoughts. Right. They start building enough energy that they use our own pineal gland as a wormhole to manifest into this reality. Right. And when that happens, you may not necessarily see them, like see the hat man, see the hood man. You know, I posted right. about that on Facebook and I was shocked how many people actually responded that they'd seen that. The hat man or the hood man. I've seen the hat man before in the distance when I was younger, but he didn't get that close, but not a good feeling. You know what I mean? Right, no. Yeah, yeah, but just, you know, so that's that's kind of situation we're in there. And this leads us back to what we talked about last time. We're immortal souls. Why we can't remember our our, our soul memories. Why they're not benefiting us right now. There's right. two reasons. One, we've got those that are trying to keep us subdued. We've got a frequency hitting us down here. A scalar frequency like yes. Nikola, Nikola Tesla talks like that nullifies our psychic abilities, our natural ones. All right. Then you've also got another issue too. Okay. If we're as immortal soul beings, it means we are truly in God's image, not some man in a throne. We're being mm -hmm. that through intent of will can use energy and matter to create space. There's an equation there, all right? But we're right. so omnipotent as the creator. So that means even on the quantum level, Robin, we know the beginning and the ending of every possible outcome. Right, right, right. If you know that, that means as an immortal soul being, you're facing two major obstacles. Stagnation 
and boredom. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's kind of like, kind of like what I often correlate this to the Bardo Thodol, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, when they describe uh -huh. like the forty-nine days of death or whatever it is. But the first part is you get all the positive things or all the negativity you put out in this lifetime comes back a million fold. Right. Enough to scare some people back into an incarnation, a body here, or even on frequencies lower, like maybe the right. levels of fluid that we talked about. Mm -hmm. and then after that, you get the second part is you get all the positive and love that you put out comes back a million fold. And they right. talk about that as being a point of almost blissing people out to a point of stagnation. Because you start generating, you experience so much bliss, you put out so much love that they, the book I read, the one I said, it kind of made it sound like um, God's on a beach that has everything brought to them they could ever want with the most beautiful scenery ever. Mm -hmm. They're never going to go anywhere and do anything. You know what I mean? Right, exactly, yeah. Creator. What's the motivation? Yeah. yeah. You're going to stop trying to completely merge with the creator. So that's, that's the second part of that. And I've said that before, people like Star Trek, Think about Q, the watch Voyager Q. One of them wanted to Q, kill themselves with suicide because there was nothing left, nothing left to experience. Right. So us as immortal soul beings, if we're like a Q, all right, there's one thing left for us to wipe ourselves clean and trick ourselves into forgetting so that we can go back and experience it all again. And, and as that? immortal soul beings, how many of us are doing that willingly? How many of us are being tricked? Not for me to judge. That's for the people listening to this can decide and feel it for themselves. No, but exactly. The factors on both. Just like when we die, it's like, man, if you get a real good sleep in and you hit theta, you go like, you've been down for like nine hours even. When you first come out of that sleep, for at least the first minute, you're kind of just groggy. Like, oh, yeah, very really oriented. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the same way of death. When we come out of this looking through a glass darkly and become aware and merge with what they call the Akashic Records, the records of space and time, everything. Yeah. Had. yeah. Once, once we kind of merge with that, but just before that, I think we're out of it for just a second. And yeah. maybe our own guardian angels can come to our aid. There are others that are trying to step in, projecting false light, pretending to look like our loved yeah. one. Exactly. I think yeah. so. Come with, yeah. me. come with me. And then you get zapped again, then you go through hypnotic wipe clean and you get sent back here saying that you had, Oh, you, you, you have a mission. Go back there, but you can't remember that either. Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. what do you what do you say? Um, like to your point of um, how you know we have this dynamic um, field around us that really we are because we're so closed <laughs> down right now, and like a lot, the technology, scalar waves, training, what we believe is possible, all these things factor in to us not being able to always see us. The the the, uh, the dimensions around us. Mm -hmm. To that point, what do you suggest people do to begin to take control of these things around us and control these dark entities? Like, what suggestions would you make? And 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 we're talking about things that people, as you know, as immortal soul beings, can do themselves. Not go someone and have someone stick something in you and pull something out and put this in and grab it and twist it around. But practical stuff that people can do themselves. Like, we don't give our power away here. Learn how to project your intent of will. Most okay. people only know how to do that if they want some grip. If they're trying to get that grip, oh, that, that, that will's all in there. They're trying to get that grip. <laughs> <laughs> but how does that, I mean, but what, what more can we do than that, all right? And the way I say that, like, I get asked sometimes about protections and what protections to do. There are a thousand different techniques, but I'll tell you yeah. one, I'm trading one thing. And you can start with one thing. One is if one of these negative, for me, when I have inorganic beings coming into my field of awareness when I'm awake, I'm right. sorry. I interrogated the heck out of them. Who are you? What do you want? Where do you got everything? I did, you know, I hate to say this, but I interrogated my own angels. For right. No, I'm doing that myself. It could have been trying to trick me, even though even though I could feel that that wasn't the case, but I just a certain amount of apprehension goes on there. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, if they come in your field of awareness, one thing we have a certain thing that aids us in the physical body, verbally express them to leave. Okay. Them to leave. You verbally say it. 
Then the second thing we want to go like into almost like that lady uh, Shakti Gawain talked about. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How to really use creative visualization. Visualize them being pushed off of you. Feel it. Put your energy and your will into that. If you think about how the creator, the prime creator, created the cosmos, it was through an act of will. Right. And I think loneliness is what I've seen, but it is what it is. Right. Well, you know, it's funny when you say that, Barry, because um, like you said, learn to project, you know, uh, their, 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 are their intent of will. And it reminds me of when I was in my early 20s, mid 20s or so. And um, I, you know, really wanted to learn how to lucid dream. You know, I've been studying a lot of Hindu stuff and, uh, you know, I'd been into transcendental meditation and, you know, doing all the stuff we all were doing. And I really felt that it was a lot going on in these altered dimensions during the dream state that I wasn't remembering. I wasn't, I wasn't active in these things. I'm just going, I'm just going to sleep every night and I'm watching a movie basically. That's what it felt like. And I really wanted to learn how to lucid dream. Mm -hmm. And I had studied some of the, uh, done some of the readings of like some of the, you know, the Hindu gurus and stuff like that. And, you know, some, um, folks like that. And, you know, they're saying, but basically it came down to is your intent. You know, before you go to sleep at night, you lay down and you, well, one technique really did seem to work, which was put a glass of water on your night table, drink, physically drink from that glass. And as you put the glass down, you tell yourself that you intend to become lucid in your dream state. So it's like the idea of coupling the physical action with the intent and the will to claim this. So it took, it took, you know, um, you know, a few weeks of me doing that, you know, but I remember the first time I went lucid in my dream state and there was tremendous freedom and control there as to what was going on. And, but it came purely from the repeated, practice of my intent putting my will to intend for this to occur very interesting very Plain and simple and then from there you know that was a huge lesson for me because i started to apply that across a lot of my spiritual practices that the clearer you are in using your right brain which is our manifesting center to see, visualize, claim. It could be colors, it can be the memory of sound or the memory of taste or the memory of flavor, whatever your thing is. It's not always visual. People always say, visualize. No, you can smell it. You can um, hear it. We all, you know, some of those senses are high or more heightened or we're able to ascertain, um, 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 we're able to claim things easier through our will, through various senses. It's not always visual, but whatever yours is, you know, when you apply that in your right brain through your imagery um, and then apply your intent, you know, just that place from your heart center, that core part of yourself that you can feel like that. You can feel when you're intending something to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world opens to us. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's really what I'm hoping that people kind of walk away with, with what we're sharing with them today is that like, go back to self, go back to belief in self and go back to some of these age old time tested, very simplistic ways of um, learning how to claim our spiritual, to, to claim ourselves and our spirits, our souls. And you know, what just came to me. I had a dream last night. I wrote it down this morning. And in that dream, it was another, it was another lucid dream because I remember kind of waking up and going through it because I woke up and told myself I had to remember this before I went back into the dream state. But what I was told, I was working with a, a teacher of some sort. Mm -hmm. And um, he had said to me, I was slicing bread. This is like wax on, wax off, basically. <laughs> It was this long loaf, loaf like French bread and I'm slicing it. And all I'm doing is slicing this bread. I mean, for hours I'm slicing bread and I'm saying to him, are you sure this is going to help me, you know, get to that piece, that place in myself that I'm, that I'm searching for, that I'm, 
that I'm looking to develop? And he said, yes, it's all about learning to slice the bread. The repetitive motion of slicing this bread is training you in focusing, in focusing, in focusing. And everything happens through focusing on what it is that you want. That was just last night. So, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, that, that comes down to, you know, that <clears throat> we've got ancestors coming back. We can access the ancestor memory, especially those of us that have melanin. It's easier to actually tap into the nuclei of our melanin and to mm -hmm. tap the race memory itself. Um, okay. Also, so you've got ancestor memories that you maybe tapping into as well. You know, that all that is coming and ascended masters as well. They're coming right. back. You know, a lot of times people are seeing these orbs. I could ask somebody, what are, what are the orbs? I think there's several things. You know, some we've got certain beings that can condense the receptacle for their consciousness into that form and use that for travel. Right. And we've got some of these flashes of light and orbs that are actually tears in between the fabric of space and time. In between right. dimensions, universes, whatever. You know what I mean? And that's becoming more frequency. People are starting to see interdimensional beings all the time now it's becoming yeah. much more common and a lot of people can't accept it you know yeah the other thing i'm noticing that's happening to me too um is the idea that um and i'm sure this you know a lot of people will say yeah I'm, i know i'm that's happening to me too is that you're driving along especially when you're on that your automatic uh memory thing you know, the thing like you can you can go from point A to point B without even really thinking about how you get there. You know, like we just do that all the time. Yeah. Is I'm driving along and all of a sudden I'll drive through a period of a, 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 a section of road that I drive all the time. And it looks nothing like to the point it'll like it'll I'll stop and get, whoa, wait a minute. Where am I? And I'm driving. I'm like, where am I? And like for like three or four seconds, you know, like you're like and then you'll look ahead and you're like, okay, but what you just went through looked nothing like. <laughs> you know, they're calling, you... It, they're calling it right now, the, there's a new theory out. It's called the Mandela effect. Mandela effect. That? Mandela? The Mandela effect. Yeah. Okay. It's saying that a lot of people remember that Mandela was killed at a different time and it was announced a different time than what it is. And it's been correlated all the way down to the Bernstein Bear Book, how it's being spelled. Different people are saying, oh, I was a kid, it was spelled this way. Now it's spelled this way. Like the two books are totally different, and they're oh, calling it like a time slip, a time jump. It's called the Mandela Effect. I don't know oh. if ex explaining it completely correct, but that's my understanding of it. So, And so what is it like? Um, I kind of sense what, you know, what came to me when I asked, it sounds like you're saying it's a similar thing is that it's like a split, it's, it's a split in the dimensions. And so like you, you know, just kind of went through a, a, a split because the, because we're with the dimensions, the fourth and the fifth dimensions are starting to change. And there's these thin lines mm -hmm. between these dimensions. And sometimes we, um, you hit a place where these dimensions are open or available or it's a split in them or whatever, like you're saying, and you're experiencing it for those few seconds um, before you get on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it goes back to spending some time. If, if it's the Mandela effect that he was killed at one time, I mean, he died at one time, but they said, was that, did that have to do with the guy that was singing at his funeral and all this stuff? Was it all related to that? I, what, you know, what, I, I'm what not an expert. That that about that? I, I, I can't tell you that one. I'm not too expert on that, you know, but as far as like that, but I mean, just more of the, the slips and things is what I've been more familiar with, you know. But they were calling it, I mean, okay, like the, um, like I remember, like you talked about the Berenstein Bears, but also that it was some other different suggestions, like, um, Oh, yeah, that's like, been a good photos that people have cell phones in, they shouldn't have cell phones in them, things like that. The the Bushka lady, like the lady who shows up with the weird box in her hand and several different pictures. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, things like that. Well, I mean, that takes us down to time travel, you know, and, and what okay. is time travel. And I can tell you two things from my experiences, what was shown to me, all right, that actually 
the earth is much more like what quantum physics is showing right now. They show me the earth being much more akin to an onion. And you know how many layers are on an onion before you get down to the core? Right. I think dimensionally, earth is like that. That's okay. part of the dimension. So I think it's a lot more than just the fourth. You know what I mean? But um, right. but uh, what, what else were you saying? Something before that. I, was, I went off to that. I'm sorry. No, we were talking about, I mean, you, when you were talking about the Mandela effect and what have you, we were going back to the idea hmm. of um, time. The time. time. Yeah. Time, 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 time travel. Uh, I, I know that that is that's capable with the beings I've dealt with. They definitely have some control over the curvature of space and time. Right. You know, beings that like can do something like take you and you're on that ship for hours and hours, you know, maybe weeks and you're put back five minutes, a minute or two before you remember space and out. But you right. been, exactly. Yeah. You got a beard or something like that. You know, we're things like that. So we're dealing with beings that can manipulate the space time continuum. It changes the whole playing field. Right. <laughs> you know, so, I, so I like the idea of the, you know, that your tip about, okay, the idea of people, you know, being able to will using their intent to will what they want. I mean, you know, it's, you know, the whole point is for us to go back to claiming our power and you know, that's been used a lot. It's so, to the point it's so cliche that people probably don't know what the heck, where to even begin with it? What would be some of the uh, some readings or some places that people would you you would suggest for folks to start? You know, Barry, like people who are listening to this and saying, "Yeah, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling like I don't want to have um, some kind of you know uh, implant removal. I don't want to take this. Uh, I don't want to make an Oregon generator thing, or I don't feel comfortable with that. Does this all doesn't resonate with me?" It feels like something I should be doing. I should be taking control of this. I mean, there's a lot of people out there feeling like that. I, I know there are. But a lot of, you know, we're, we've moved so far away from books and readings, you know, um, and, and having reading lists any longer. Everything is just Google it and something yeah. comes up and you may read a paragraph or so. What would you say are some good places for people to read? You mean just like a beginning point? Yeah, just a bit, like for me, like one of them to me is like the autobiography of a yogi. I think that's just a good. I was going to say that. That's a good That's a good starting point. I actually posted that a couple of times, a couple of days now, because I think oh, a lot really? of people take the time to really read that book and see what he's saying about healings, what he's saying about his journey, you know? Right. Um, you know, there, there are others. I mean, it, it, I mean, it depends on your perspective. If you're coming from this perspective, is since I kind of started talking, I mean, a lot of people seem to be interested in the extraterrestrial contact I've had. That seems to overtake the near-death experience I had, angelic communications, and any other metaphysical things, paranormal things I can discuss. It seems like that's the, the foundation there. I found a lot of people that are attracted to that at, like, Bringers of the Dawn. That's by... Yeah, Bringers. that's a good one, Bringers of the Dawn. Yep. That's a good beginning one. There's another one that I don't culturally agree with, the Prism of Lyra, that's one. Uh -huh. um, uh, people that are interested in Atlantis and Mu, I would say Edgar Casey on Atlantis is a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. Good one. I that also like um, one I read years ago, the Holographic Paradigm and other and other paradoxes. That's a good one to help people with quantum physics, the idea of quant the quantum field and um, and uh, time continuum. The and holograph the holographic concepts mm -hmm. um that's one i would suggest because it, it really kind of in in layman's understanding helps you to understand really that whole that whole piece that's often talked you hear people banting around oh quantum this and you know this and you know holograph but a lot of times people don't have the basis of what what is that actually in science i mean most yeah. people don't understand that quantum physics is what allows your television to work. If it wasn't for the chaos theory, you like have been discovered, there would be no such thing as a television. So, I mean, there's some basic stuff in that book that helps you just kind of bring it in, you know? Yeah, you know, I, there's, another, there's another one too. Um, the, um, and this book, I've got some quorums about this book I'll go into, but a book that's a good reference, at least the first part of it, the Uranta book, that's a good one, you know? Oh. And, yeah, I would yeah. say that. And here, here's the problem I have with the Uranta book, all right? 
when it comes down to the race part and the cultural part, uh -huh. that book is total crap. So that part of it, so use discernment with it. But um, the first part of the book, um, uh, it designed, it talks about the hierarchy, the, the design of the universes on kind of a quantum level to a degree. That's, that's a good part of that book there. And right. take that and kind of contrast that with another book by J.J. Hurtock. Yes. A.K. called King, the, the Keys of Enoch. Boy, that's a Keys of Enoch. That's a hell of a book. But if you can get it. Yeah, it breaks down things quantum physically a lot. Now, I dislike both books. I dislike the religious connotation that they're. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. But I mean, but as far as a tool, they're good tools, you know. Those and another one that I find is just a real basic tool. And I, I went through the study course years ago. I thought I just recently pulled some of it back up. But um, the work of um, ah, Sir Walter Russell. Walter Russell. Uh, he's done a number of books on the electric universe. Wow. Um, um, the other one, one of his, it's a real quick, small pamphlet, but it's... Uh, Something like Man in the Universe or something like that. But a lot of Walter Russell's works are really, really good. Um, and you can hang in there with them. I mean, people are just getting back to his work right now. When you start hearing things about like the electric universe and things like this, he was talking about this in the 30s. Um, he had uh, um, gone into a place where, you know, a lot was revealed to him. Um, mm -hmm. He calls it 30, he was 30 days on a summit or something like that, he calls it. But you know, um, so I'll, I'll make sure I put those in the show notes. But well, I think to your point though, Barry, which is why I like talking to you is because you've had, I mean, you've had these, um, you've been experienced or you've had these onboard um, experiences that you remember and you've had them repeatedly. You've had a lot of information during those sessions with, um, with non-terrestrial beings sharing these things to you, consciousness beings, silicone beings. You talk about all these different types of folks you've run into. And I think, to me, what I was attracted to in you was the idea that you ground it. You ground a lot of what you're saying. It doesn't seem like it's this big egoic trip about I've been on a spaceship, I've done this, oh, it's like this, it's like that. It's like you bring this material back and it's palatable. It's like, you know, and you were the first one to get me to understand that I had been having contact when I'm the first one to say I never was contacted. You know, when our last show, I said to you, I didn't, I mean, I've seen a couple of times, I saw what I thought might have been a, a UFO of some sort, but I didn't feel like I had had any contact. And you, in a very practical way, broke that down. You. Now you know that. I mean, to interrupt you, excuse me, but now you know they've been chasing after you for our conversation earlier. They were, they've been waiting. Yeah, <laughs> and you yeah, always. And it was like that contact between. I mean, so a lot of people. I know that you were definitely a catalyst to get me to open up more to what the, these non-terrestrial beings, our star brothers and sisters, were trying to help me with, but I wasn't open to it because I just, I wasn't, I was close to it. I just never felt I had an experience. I just never saw myself in that category. And I believe part of the role that you've been playing by even coming forward is that I think in your way, you have been connecting the dots for a lot of people and causing people to see that, yeah, this is just like breathing. This is just like, go ahead. Oh, no, I just want to interject something because it's, no, it's please, a, please do. Line of what we're talking about. You know, you describe trying to dream lucidly, all right? And I almost took that back to Castaneda again because I'm not a dreamer, all right? I had to feel, I have to free up enough of my waking consciousness to have enough energy to have dream attention, dream lucid, oh. you know what I mean? Um, right. Nonetheless, we spoke about the beings that come and meet us halfway and, and pop up in our dreams because we're halfway through, we're halfway in the dream, we're in the dream body. But right. you, I think that's that was happening all the time and you can't remember it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not, not anymore. Exactly. Than I go on those ships, and I know it sounds kind of cool when I talk about it now, but let me tell you, um, those experiences at first when I was a late teenager in my early 20s, I was missing a lot of time. 
like I, mean, I almost I almost was with I was with somebody that I, and they they got away from me because they said this stuff is real. I'm seeing these ships and we're losing time. You know what I mean? They they, they kicked me to the curb and I was a old too. But anyway, uh, so you, they say you nice and real cute and I like you a lot. But I didn't sign up for all this alien invasion. <laughs> they, they, they told a friend of mine. They said, you know, when I got away from him, that stuff stopped. You oh. know. <laughs> Fair enough. But nonetheless, um, you know, in the dream, in the dream, in the dreamscape, in the dreamscape, they can contact and communicate with you so much more. But yes. it's the same thing. It's hard to remember. Like, let's say, for example, when I was on one of these ships physically, I thought I couldn't remember anything. I'm like, did they wipe my mind? What happened? But the truth is, the vibration was so different that it made the retention of the memory of the event horizon itself difficult. You know what right. I mean? Where I couldn't reconstruct it. I tried. I tried to do the meditation. I tried to do it in Lotus, which to me sucks. It's a terrible <laughs> position to meditate. In. It's not comfortable at all, man. Oh, anyway, oh, anyway. Definitely a comfortable <laughs> either, but okay. Yeah, I tried all that. I got the certification to hypnosis, so I could try to self hypnotize myself, and I right. still can't retrieve the memories. You right. know what I mean? More, just flashes. I had to go get professionally hypnotized by somebody else. Finally, I finally just right. gave it and did it. You know, but nonetheless, it has its place, though. And we want to say in this conversation, we're not saying that everything should be the self relying on the self. But certainly there are a lot of people out here with legitimate help. Mm -hmm. But you have to make sure that through your intention that you seek someone that honors your own space when they're working with you. That's what you, you, know, you got to make sure you're looking for that. And then it's then it's fine. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's about the, like hypnotists. I say make sure it's one you get a rapport with before you do any kind of monetary exchange. Go talk to them a few times. Right. Make sure that you even feel comfortable enough that they're going to be able to take you down to the deeper deeper levels of consciousness, like theta. You know what that's I mean? Better, yeah. I, I had to go that deep to get these memories back. And then when I actually access them, nothing bad happened to me, but it blew me away. But I will say this: someone who's having experiences like I have, and other people will say it, it f's your life up a lot. Yeah. I mean, I'm, try, I'm trying to get my, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to get, trying to get my degree. I'm up here thinking about spaceships. The, the professor's talking. I'm looking at him, going, I wonder if he's got some Neanderth Neanderthal DNA or he's got extraterrestrial DNA. Right, exactly. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else. You know what I mean? So, in that way, in some ways, it, it, it's cool now. But I went through my whole life hiding this stuff. And had right. I died in an accident, I wouldn't be saying it now. I would not be telling people about it. But right. that's, God had a different plan. We can only resist. Well, thank God he did. Yes. Because it's like when you and I were talking, you know, so since the last show, I think we did one about three weeks ago now. And um, that that one, is it's doing good. You've got several thousand views. And, you know, I think people really were connecting in with that one on you, Barry. But um Last week, you know, was the first time that, and I was explaining to you offline that I remember actually being in a ship, um, not anything like you would think a ship was going to be. It was definitely more of energy signature. It was, a, you know, the beings there were consciousness. Just, you know, I, I, I saw it as energy signatures. That's how I said it. I think it's the same as consciousness. Um, you want to tell everybody kind of what happened. You, you, you jumped into it. I don't think everybody knows, do they? Okay, so I had I fell asleep. Uh, this was, I think, last Tuesday or Wednesday. And, um, you know, at some point I went into a dream state. And I became lucid um, almost immediately when I saw that I was aboard a ship. And um, I'm sort of looking around and... It would, you know, probably in a large way, you could say it was almost holographic because you knew that it was there, but it didn't necessarily feel like it was solid, but it didn't feel like it wasn't solid either. You know, um, you would see long corridors going places. And then in that same moment, you would just see sort of this bubble of a room that you're in. Um, and uh, one of the gentlemen that I know that I've interviewed on the show before, um, Sergeant uh, Dan McBolan, I recognized his energy signature and I said, Dan, that's you? And he said, yeah, it is. And I'm like, what is going on? And he says, well, you're up here, you know, we're doing some work. You're in, you know, you're in training. You're going to be okay. See ya. I'm working. He was gone. I mean, that was all of like 
20 seconds or so. This conversation went on. Never saw him again, but I was working with this energy that I felt was male, just felt masculine, you know. Um, and during this whole time, I'm sitting there, he's sitting next to me, and he's talking, but it's all, te it's all telepathic. None of this is moving mouth. So when you try to break it down into words, it feels like you're putting a lot of extra words into these conversations that really didn't exist, but for the sake of being able to use words, you know, I've got to say it like this. So he basically said I was in training. During this whole time, it was nothing but symbols floating all around the place. It's like you think to go back to the Star Trek and now you, you know when they touch something, the whole screen goes whoop, and like it's all the universe and the cosmos and everything are moving around. That's how it was. Um, it was just all these symbols and stuff just floating and moving around the place. And um, my, my teacher, um, he was, you know, we show, I was seeing a lot of gears and he was showing these gears and he said, these are the keys to, to open up various gateways to various dimensions. We use this when we're traveling. Um, and, but you have to use them correctly because if they're not open properly with the other proper protective coordinates that are over here and all these symbols are flying around the place, you can get jammed up in between these dimensions and that wasn't your intention. So I'm thinking at this point, I'm like, how am I gonna remember all this? You know, I'm saying this to him. He says, don't worry, you're gonna remember it. Over time, it's going to have a use. Right now, we're just introducing this this thing, thing, or you know, wanting you to learn this. And I'm like, well, what are all these symbols? You know, he says it's like math. Don't worry. I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't do math like this. I don't do good with math in America on Earth. So I don't know what <laughs> to do up here with the open up galactic systems. And I'm saying this to him. I'm like, math. Well, where's the numbers? There was no numbers, but there were things like greater and less than signs. There were decimals. There were equal signs. There were infinity signs. There were, when you think about mathematically that way, there were these things and they were, they were worked in between these other kinds of symbols and stuff. So I could see where maybe it were equations, you know, but basically I, during this period of time, I was laying there and sleeping or, you know, in this lucid state. And I'm saying to myself, I need to wake up because I need to see if, the, if I'm lucid. And I can. I can just open my eyes. I can look around my bedroom. I see all the stuff in my bedroom. And then when I close my eyes, I'm right back into that lucid, that lucid state. Whatever, whatever dimension creates, I don't know where you are when you're lucid. I don't know what wave of what state if that was that state i don't know what state that is but it allows me to open my eyes look around and then close my eyes and pick up with where things are and so i did this repeatedly i can remember maybe two or three times but towards the end of this when it was time for me to when this experience was coming to an end the main thing that he told me he wanted me to remember he said remember the gears remember he called them they were he was calling them gears because i think i was calling them gears but really what I think they were were more like, like if you think about the ancient sundials and mandalas and stuff like that, they're those kind of turnkeys. They were more of those type of turnkeys. I was calling them gears. And so I think he allowed me to do that. But in retrospect, when I was coming, when I was in that dream state thinking about it, I was like, they really looked more like they could have been those kind of um, sundials or mandelas of some sort whatever so i came out of that and basically i remembered everything that i'm sharing i don't know if there's other stuff that happened that i didn't remember but i can tell you that i wasn't frightened it wasn't a negative experience at all i was compliant i i knew i had agreed to be there the fact that i could open my eyes and close them again and be in it told me that i that was my way of proving to myself that i was agreeing this whole thing because it would have been easy for me to open my eyes and shut it down at that point um so yeah this just happened last week and then you and i were talking the, the other night i um i was sharing with you i was sitting outside and uh you know here come across the right about 100 150 feet high was this ball but it looked like it was a flame like if you think of a flame in a fireplace 
to the naked eye, it looked like a flame and it was an orb of some sort and it was moving along. I looked at it for about two minutes because when I taped it on my phone, I caught about a minute and a half of it. It took me running back in the house, getting my phone coming back out. Um, and I showed that to you earlier, but it looked more when you take a picture of it, it looks just like pure energy. It just looks like an orb of some sort, like white light or you definitely sense it's energetic. And so I felt that that was a continuation of whatever happened a few days earlier that he had said that he was going to continue to make the training was going to continue. And I would be consciously aware of this stuff going on. So I shared that with you and you said, <laughs> cause you're like, you're, you're my go-to guy on this because like you started this. So <laughs> all I can tell you is how it made me feel, but you know more of the ins and outs of this whole thing. Well, two things to keep in mind. All right. We just got through talking about, the dream body and the physical body. They're two separate bodies. They're two separate ways, but we can put our total cognitive awareness into either. Like right now, most of our cognitive awareness is channeled, keeping the third dimensional solid, keeping all the, everything like it is right now. All right. Okay. But we can also channel that into our dream body, which I call dream attention, but that goes to a degree of where you are totally corporeal in that body as well. Now, during your experience, your astral body, your dream body was bi-located, all right? So your dream body is on the ship. We've got a natural kind of self-preservation mechanism that always tries to bring our body back or keep our body alive here. So when you're right. thinking with your intent, am I awake, am I asleep, you open up your eyes, and with your physical body, you're seeing that, but most of your energy and your attention your awareness was in the dream body mm -hmm. close your eyes back you immediately went right back to that and right. that's probably with the aid of the technology they're using too you know what i mean um, yes number two we discussed and something that you've said a couple of times your guide you say he 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 but actually you didn't actually see anyone i no saw physical. no one and part of that is because they're non-physical and I, it took me a long time to get used to that, being on any of these ships and uh, thinking, you know, well, wh where's Kirk? Where's Spock? Where's Kirk? Yeah, where are people? We're, we're, the, we're on board a physical creation that right. it, it takes man, man, hands have to make that. Physical creatures have to make that. So right. you think the, the, the crew members must be physical also, and a lot of them are not. It doesn't work like that. Number two, at least some of the times it doesn't. I can't speak for all experiences, just the beings I've dealt with. Um, another thing, you were, I would say, on the bridge, okay? And you're dealing with the bridge for non-corporeal beings that is using the symbols you showed me that you, you're talking about. Right. Activating software, se I'm sorry, self-activating symbols for self-activating software and machinery. That's okay. How else, except for the power of will of intent, and with these symbols, would a non-corporeal, non-physical crew control the ship symbiotically? Yeah, it's deep. Yeah, when you told me that, I'm like, wow, that is deep. But that's exactly because he was saying that each of these sets of symbols, some of it was defense mechanism, like some of it would activate defense for the ship if it was in danger. These mm -hmm. set of symbols operated that. Some opened the gates. Some of it um, were had to do with just some of the basic movement of the ship um between time i mean he was explaining all these different things to two th Go ahead. you might want to check this out all right the carrot documents all right what is it c-a-r-a-t carrot documents okay what that is um it's got a bunch of blueprints for self-activating software okay. that coincidentally Look like crop circles. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> and that's something. Because crop circles look like a lot of gears and stuff like that. A lot of times you see those formations. Yeah. And as you mentioned. Well, if you think of that in that terms, you know, several um, of the ancient monolithic structures such as uh, Stonehenge. Right. And I think the Vicky Tempe resonate at like 12 megahertz, which is the same level as binaural beats to brain entrainment. I think um, we're looking. We're looking at uh, 
that's been going on. It's terraforming. They're terraforming the planet. That's what the crop circles are. The crop circles would be the soft, the 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 the, the self activating software part, and somewhere like the Big A Tempe would be or Stink Stonehenge would be the hardware. I think the self activating hardware. I get what that, yeah. another, something else he's coming to mind as you described this bridge you were on. You said maybe check out uh, Linda Bolton Howe and what she says about the Mendel Mendel Forest experience. M E N D L Forest or Mendel Mendel something. It'll come up when you, you YouTube it. Yeah, I think I've seen that word before. Go ahead. What the guy says about when he actually touched that 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 he, he said it was an incubator. And when he touched it, the symbols he saw, like what you're seeing. I've seen different devices they have that have looked like fiber optic uh, wires coming yeah. out of it. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. Something called natural light. It looks similar to that. But mm -hmm. before that, on the crystal themselves, are very odd symbols. Yeah. Now, also what's interesting about that, when you were talking about the symbols, because um, you and I, talk, one of the things we talked about was that the, it, it what's also the inside is not like what I would have thought the inside would have been. So it was actually almost like the color of my skin. It was kind of like a, a, a coppery brown color, uh -huh. the whole inside of it. And it looked, it, it, it almost looked like a skin or the inside of, it looked almost like skin or something because it was about this color. Bingo, and, bingo, ding, ding, ding. And it looked really uh, smooth, and but it didn't look like it didn't look like marble, or it didn't look like glass. It didn't look like any. It looked like, but you could almost sort of look through. It's almost like you could have put your hand through it too. Like if you went out to touch it, your hand would have gone through it. But it was like this kind of coloring, and all the symbols that were showing up were black. They weren't like white or a light color like you might think on a, on a teleprompter or like those screens on Starship when they go up, everything looks like white. All the symbols were black and they, and they shone perfectly nicely against this color, the way he was doing it. Well, you know, it keeps coming as you say this over and over. And I've never, to be the science fiction geek I should be, I've only watched a few of these, I've never watched those series, the Stargate series. You know when I've they never looked at them either. Marvel, yeah. you have those symbols and the thing goes around and it locks. And if you look at the carrot documents, all right, okay. one of the recovered uh, pieces of debris they have is a um, it's a spiral. Ah, it's a spiral with the spikes. You you show you showed it to me basically on your drawing. You'll see. Let it. me see. I have it. Um, I can put it up right here real quick. Um, yeah, these are the ones I did. Right uh, there. I'll put, I'll put them up so people can see them. Far left. On second page, far right left is circuit. Up, oh, yeah, yeah, that one right there. That looks like no over back. Yeah, yeah, right there. That looks okay. like one, and I've seen the symbol below it before. But um, the one on top. This one right be, here, you the one below it. Too, you said you've I, seen before. I've seen that before. Yeah, I've seen that. Well, see how with the this is where it started. But you see how you have this, and then it's like these equal signs, or there's dots. And they're greater than less than like it's crazy how those were mixed in with do you know do you know who mary rodwell is no mary rodwell runs the uh australian uh contact deal i did that show with her her and peter maxwell and she no, deals with star seeds and she's kind of one of the world authority on contact right now but she oh. deals with a lot of star star seeds and symbols like that I think she even maybe collects them. You might want to get in contact with her as send her a copy of it. Because right now, I'm seeing so many awake people making different symbols, and I'm wondering at what point does this become self-activating software itself? Yes, exactly. Like, like the carrot documents, the carrot documents, if you even put like two of those, the guy would say if you took two of the diagrams together, they start floating. And there's, I, I even post that on Facebook again. Um, there's a piece of debris engine debris from Roswell or somewhere, but mm -hmm. it's got these floating pieces that will float around it, but it's got these symbols. Crop, oh. Symbols look like crop circles around them, and when they get in the vicinity of each other, the documents on it, they start floating, okay? With the got field, it. you can't even get between them. It creates a force field, but they start floating. Anti-gravity technology, 
that is spurred by ancient symbol by symbols, self-activating symbols that look like crop circles. I'm just right. drawing a few lines here for people. I'm not saying that's all that crop circles do. I think they're connected to binary. I think they're connected to all sorts of stuff. But one thing, I think they're also marking marking the spots and progress for time travelers. I honestly believe that. I believe and some it's funny that you, I, I, I definitely am resonating to that because it's funny that you should mention about the crop circles and <clears throat> I mean, and uh, Stonehenge and what have you. I've started working with uh, Maria Wheatley. I'm actually going to have her on the show <clears throat> in a couple of weeks, but um, she's taking me on as a student um, and learning, you know, the, the dowsing, the whole earth ley line, uh, the frequencies of, of the of the earth of Gaia of the, of the ley lines and um, the energy behind the crop circles what have you and you know it's something I mean I've always been interested in that sort of thing but here recently in the last year or so I really just under you know it just really became more connected to Gaia and realizing the idea of wanting to have more information on earth the ley line system the grid systems and um, like, like I do with most people, I see people on YouTube or I see people doing lectures, just like you, I reached out to you. I reached out to her and we've been talking for months now. We've probably almost going on a year and, um, uh, and now she's starting to, you know, to train me in this stuff. So it's no wonder, I mean, it's, it's not an accident that that was an interest and you, you, you're making this correlation to this thing that I had last week, this experience, and the idea of these self-activating symbols. I find that fascinating. No, I'm I, definitely going to look up that carrot, doc, carrot document. No, I, I'll, I'll, share, I'll share, share this too. Um, several different types of craft. You know, One is you have like physical craft, like almost look like they're government-related or something, okay? Yeah. Then you've got their more physical craft, though. But then you've got also plasma ships. You've got condensed light ships. And then you've got pure consciousness ships. What implies or what are these ships actually? Because the next receptacle for our consciousness, when we go beyond the physical body, evolve beyond that, is supposed mm -hmm. to be the Merkaba body, the dream body. The, the, right, the Merkaba, yeah. Then we could make into a ship and have a symbiotic relationship with non, other non-corporeal beings to ride in us. So how much? How many of these ships are we seeing? Are we looking at ourselves? Looking back at ourselves? And yeah. You start getting when you start getting into the quantum level of it. The whole thing is so mixed together. You know what I mean? Right. And not always the separate classifications we want there to be. I personally couldn't accept at first that some of these containers I'm seeing on these ships, these eggs, and with this mist inside and these light floating around in there. And uh -huh. some crew members that are certainly out of phase, slightly out of phase, I look at them and they're looking at the eggs too. You know, and I was obsessed when I hypnotist, my hypnotist, I asked her, I want to know if I've been attacked. I don't think I have. But I want to know if I've been attacked or if I've ever been subjected to virtual reality scenario technology. And so okay. I want to know. So I did, a hip, I, I, did, I did a session just to find that out. <laughs> okay. And what did you find out? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've been with right. the virtual reality scenario technology on a pure consciousness ship that I was just about to describe. First thing when I get on it, when I get done about to throw up, when you first get on there, I mean, it's, just, it's horrible. It, it's in motion. The rooms are moving around you. The things are wow. moving. It, they, as they say, dimensional uh, distortment leads to temporal aphasia, which means you're kind of out of it. You know what I mean? Right. And it gets worse. Anyway, um. A helmet came down from the ceiling and uh, it was uh, once again like the ship you just described and you're describing an organic ship you're describing walls that are organic mm -hmm. you know what I mean? this thing comes yeah. down a helmet too big for my head all right then they called it a synaptic helmet is what they called it um, and it went over my head it's got these knobs on it and it uh, it stayed on for a second they pulled it off and I could perceive things better and they immediately wow. told me, that is virtual reality segment scenario technology to help you have a frame of reference or we won't be able to communicate. There's that much of a distortment between our vibrations. You know, gotcha. yeah, they yeah. told me, beware though, the lower beings, the lower vibrations have taken this and uh, perverted this technology to deceive humans and deceive people. 
Wow. That makes total sense. And I had yeah. only heard, you know, I, I waited to hear something about that. And like someone like Carla Turner, Turner was talking about that. Virtual reality, holographic technology they use, why some people see their loved ones on these ships all of a sudden, dead people and all the things like oh, that. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's deception. And, you yeah, know, it's so easy for what we call demons to come in through what we just talked about, project themselves, negative thought forms, project out, and use alien abduction as screen memory for possession. Quite right. easy. You know what I mean? And uh, anyway. I can see that. Sorry, I feel like I got somewhere way out what you were asking me. I'm sorry. I, no, no, that's good. No, that. No, I mean, I'm glad you explained that. I mean, that's another experience that you've explained that I haven't heard before with this synaptic helmet. So, I mean, <clears throat> but that's what it's about. I mean, I think part of it is that, you know, this is a reality. This is a coming reality. We're merging with our non-terrestrial uh, families. I mean, it's happening you know, as we speak. And the more that we can approach it from a standpoint of information, knowledge, lack of fear, and understanding how we're totally in control of these encounters, the better it's going to be for, like you were talking about, the whole idea of the crop circles and everything, this whole encoding that's happening all around us. And it's time for us to come out of kindergarten with this whole UFO ET alien thing and get, on, get in with the program that this is reality and it's nothing to fear. It's things you can control. You can choose and you know come in, in and out of these experiences as you be more comfortable with them. But they're here totally for the fulfillment of humanity, of, 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 of Gaia, of the planet, of, of our species. It's not this thing to be fearful of. And I mean, I think that's what, you know, I'm hoping that's what we're getting across with this with the, with our conversations in that it's no more I mean to bring it back full circle it's it's no different than the fear that people had in the early days you know trying you know medicinal um <clears throat> substances you know i mean done anything done properly well e even that was done with more the building. ram das that was his name yeah. ram das that's who i was thinking of mm. Never heard of them. When we were talking about experimental drugs and, uh, and the 60s and um, uh, Woodstock and all that. But go ahead. He's still uh, around. As far as like, oftentimes, haven't you wondered how many people must die for us to know what is good to eat, let alone to know yes. what is a hallucinogenic earth plant? It's simple. In the other cycle, we could see by energy, we could see the form of man. I told you it's kind of a mushroom type of form all right? right and we can see the energy field of certain plants have one that is either the same or greater than man some right. have creation completely different than ours that are obviously poisonous to us right Sears back then Sears, <laughs> it was Sears who, yeah. and you know what also at one point I was doing some um you know I had some information being uh shared with me through my um my dream time and Basically, the way I was, it was shared with me that that worked, or in, in one reality works like this, is that, you know, everything, we're, every, you know, we exist in this big circle. And we're like, you know, our point of consciousness is in the middle of the circle, let's say. And in any direction, you know, our life is going in all these directions, and every direction off the point of the circle is also the, like your, your, your onion analogy that in every direction an arrow is going, it's also going through multiple layers of dimensions and existences. And that when you want to know something, you simply take the, you, you take the direction to your future self that holds the memory that's the answer for the present self. And this is something that we do through intent. You know, and so when you want to find out something, even as a seer, I mean, you know, you want to find out, you know, um, is this plant good for me? You know, you simply go to your future self that holds the memory to the answer to that. And I believe that that's been shown to me a lot of different ways in some of my dream time and, and some of my writings. And I believe that that's kind of where we are. I mean, that goes back to kind of what you were talking about here.
What you thinking, Barry? <laughs> you just yeah, I, was like, yeah. I was listening. Uh, yeah. I was just listening. That's all. I was checking out what you were saying. You know. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's something that um, I started kind of dealing with a couple of years ago, and you know I've started just using that. I've just started just asking that. You know, asking you know that that future self of that memory. I mean, because it's all it's kind of all happening now anyhow, as we understand time and the bending of time. So, you know, it goes back to soul, there would be none as a mortal soul. You already know the outcome of every personal possible outcome. Right. It goes back to that immortal soul thing you're saying. Yeah. And since we're creatures of linear time, and then, you know, sometimes we have to use that time, um, that linear time format to help our brain assess it. You don't have to do it that way, you know, but I mean, it kind of goes back to that, um, to that type of way of dealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, yeah, just a, mm -hmm. expanding awareness. That's where it's at in consciousness. What is it? Expanding consciousness and awareness. That's really exactly all together. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, the point of where now people are still saying, talking about, oh, paranormal, extraterrestrials, when there really, there is no paranormal. It's only the normal. Because we don't it's know. Only normal. <laughs> I mean, excuse me, ladies. We really know nothing. So I mean, that's why it's only it's only really the the normal, everything the paranormal, and these are things that like right now the Hubble telescope has showed us we have over three hundred and fifty billion galaxies, like the Milky Way, and much bigger in the cosmos that we can see physically. So I mean, that right there, and you know, and I got people like a person in my family the other day. There's no way that there's any life anywhere but here on Earth because it's not proven. Okay, you say so. All right. Yeah, yeah but it hasn't yeah. been not proven either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget about proven, the but it hasn't been proven otherwise either, you know? There's no way that those over innumerable amounts of suns, there's no way there's any life, life out there at all. It's got to be beginning and ending here, you know? But it's stuff like that that keeps us this disconnection, you know? Right, I've been talking, exactly. I've been talking a lot about something that people really don't seem to want to talk about or mm -hmm. die right now and it's something that I got exposed to in one of my contact experiences as a kid couldn't remember it but had a you know it comes back at after time and I'm knowing real as an adult I've seen it all right that's what's called the resurrection and the soul transfer technology and you've got dozens and dozens of experiencers that saying they they've experienced this and we can follow religion behind what a few people said they experienced behind partially corrupt historical records, but we won't pay attention to what a large part of our population is saying they're experiencing right now. Uh -huh. I give an example, like I brought something up, and this is um, what you've got tons of people that have experiencing, experienced the tall praying mantis. Right, I've heard about that. I've, I've experienced insect, insectoid, but it wasn't a praying mantis. Um, anyway, um, a lot of people <laughs> say that they see light coming out of the mouth of the praying mantis, or coming off the head, all right? And uh -huh. a lot of the time these praying mantises say, we're older than your solar system, and we, we're we the planters of your solar system and many others, all right? That implies that they're what are called life carriers. We mentioned the Uranta book. It describes the life carriers very well. To me, what I see has always been panspermia and what's called angel hair. But I never thought, what all actually receptacles would a life carrier need mm -hmm. i never thought about that you know what i mean if somebody uh, posted it and challenged oh some of them are good some of them are bad and that's a person that's had no experiences but they're telling everybody what they are okay anyway right. so wait, let me just ask you something so i can be clear because you don't you you've gone down a rabbit hole i ain't even been down yet um so i've heard about the praying man man this is being beings how does that Correlate to what you were talking about the light or angel hair you were you were throwing a few I think correlate uh, Correlating um, oh, oh, sorry. I was the praying mantis is saying that they seeded our planet and seeded our solar system They're saying they were older than our solar system Okay, what of any type of being with any kind of corporeal form is nearly impossible to comprehend All right, but when right. they say that we could call them planters or what the Uranta book calls them life carriers and the Uranta book gives a very big description of what life carriers are 
that seed all the universes and solar systems and all that. All right. Is that L I G H T or is it L I F E? Life. 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 L I F E. Okay. Life, life carriers. Got you. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. What I've seen, they appear to be more like panspermia or what people call angel hair, which is seen floating in our atmosphere sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see what I mean. They interacted with amino acids, and that's kind of what the life carriers were, I thought, for each planet. But I never thought of what would be a physical receptacle be for one of those beings beyond that. I never thought about that. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that that's what the praying mantis are, but there's something going on there. And a lot of people that have had clones that made of themselves, clone bodies, or seen clones of people on these ships, the praying mantis have been there for that too. And then oh. they, there's a brother, I can't, his name Dale, or it's a brother that talks about, um, in fact, I posted on my YouTube channel. He talks about how he has another body on this ship. He's about 65 years, 60, 62 years old now, but he's got a body on one of these ships that's 25 years old. And he's, What's his name, Dale what? I, oh, I, I don't, okay. there's, there's another guy named Dale that's a whistleblower. I don't want to say his name. It's on my YouTube channel. It's uh, I'll check it out. It, it says copying praying praying mantis copying bodies. Uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah, and what 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 he says though is that uh, he says this that 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 other that copy of me is a automaton. It's 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 a lifeless cadaver until they what bilocate his dream body basically his consciousness into that body and it starts oh i got you i see yeah but you've got i mean you've got things that this gets so deep that i've heard an experiencer recount by somebody that also was government connected should be saying that word excuse me anyway <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he was saying how as a child he had to get regressed for his childhood experiences missing time and one of them was for he's on a ship and they're taking the the white blood blood cells out of his body all right and when he gets done, he's going to leave, but he sees he's in this chamber that's huge with all wow. different tubes in there. And he goes and looks in one, and there's a being that has a humanoid body, but with octopus tentacles off of it. All right? What? Yeah. Wow. He said, he said that was just one. But he said there were thousands and thousands of these clone chambers. I mean, who knows who was, what was in all of them? And to me, I'm sorry, not to tra travel on people's religious stuff, but that sounds a lot like the Ark to me, which is impossibility unless it was dealing. It sounds with a lot like what to you, the Ark? Oh, the Ark! Yeah, oh, I see what you're saying. It was impossibility unless you were dealing with DNA slides, DNA like like almost on microfiche. If you're dealing with yeah. DNA and eugenics like that, that's very possible. But I'm, I'm yes. throwing that out there, like the resurrection technology. People don't like touching that either. A lot of people that have seen this, okay, seen healings going on by this technology, and what? That interferes with a religious figure very much, doesn't it? That died and came back. And right, which is all, but that's, and that, we go back to all that being the story. And it's not that, um, you know, in my case, I'm sure the same for you, it's not that we, you don't have a belief in God. It's not that you don't have a belief in a superior being creator type. It's not that, I mean, I don't even have a problem that with uh, the idea that a being named Christ walked the earth. I believe he was just on a mission to come back down here. Like so many, I mean, he was a, a, a being that um, had gone so many dimensions high. Like you were even talking about like this 16th dimension and all this stuff. And, you know, and, and had a played a role in coming back down here and trying to straighten a few things out. I mean, like in like Buddha or anybody, you know, you know, they're in other words, it's not so much that some of this stuff is not a reality as much as it's not a reality in the religious content that it's been framed in order to see, keep a tight, keep your mind and your abilities to do everything we've been talking about for the last hour and a half at bay and under control. Because a lot of these things fly in the face of what you're told you good, in my case, I'll speak for me, good Christians are supposed to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, I mean, you know, you can't even have a reincarnation conversation. You're not even allowed to start there. So if you can't start there, how do you talk about these other experiences? Well, you know, so the, I'm with you. you know, well, everybody wants to end it at this cycle right now. We're in a new cycle. And when you talk about people like, 
Christ, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Confucius, uh, yes. Quetzalcoatl, Muhammad, whoever. whoever. That, that's this cycle right now. And I believe that Christ was called the Son of God. But in reality, you have another cycle, what I remember, what I was a part of, that we were called the sons of God. And we yes. were somewhere else. And yep. we all met elongated craniums and were melanin dominant with people getting upset for me saying that now. People don't want me to keep talking about that. It doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. It does matter with this culture, oppressive culture we're in right now, all the facts need to come out. I'm with you. I'm with you on that one, buddy. Yeah, especially concerning melanin dominancy. That needs what? to come out. You know, if it, it wasn't for my out, it? now, if I had not reincarnated with this now, I would not have access to the past life memories. I would not have been able to really crystallize them like I was able to through what's called black dot theory, which is something done, done by Richard Dr. Richard King. But no one wants to what's hear it. Called black, what? black what theory? Black dot theory. And that's, okay. that's in a book by Dr. Richard King that's entitled uh, African Biological Psychiatry. And okay. he has another one called Melanin, The Key to Freedom, Volumes 1 and 2. He's a bad brother. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's doing and see, yeah. Uh, No, I mean, no, keep on. I mean, that. I said he's I'm doing that one up. I mean, but that's. Tonyama, the Science of Breathing, using that and using visualization, a looking technique on the Eye of Horus, which the middle of is actually pure melanin the center of the eye of Horus, and how to use that to actually revive yep. release memory through your melanin. So, you know, but anyway, no one wants to talk about that. I've been called a racist, so we'll move on. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, we get, we get to bring everything out. I mean, you know, because at the end of the day, this all benefits everyone. I mean, because all this technology is coming together to, mm -hmm. to, to free us all and to free the planet. I mean, you know, it's, it, it I think, to, I think to your point, and I know to mine, is that it's like you're trying to look at a puzzle and some key pieces you decide that you're not going to put in. Uh, uh, but these key pieces have to be put in in order for the puzzle to make sense. And this is what I think also, uh, when I started really understanding melanin and the importance of it and what have you, Yeah. that... I think that's why people who are lighter skinned, white skinned and what have you, enjoy receiving the melanin through the sun. I mean, I think it's a natural, to me, I think it's a natural thing to wanna do to help increase the melanin. I also believe that because that knowledge is the truth, the beings that are controlling this thing to try to keep feeding off of us has put the lie out there that you're gonna get cancer from the sun. It's gonna, you know, you can't be, you know, all these things to scare people back into not wanting that exposure because the more we dominate and we come together as a group, of, you know, with, and with all our facilities working, you know, all these things we talked about fully engaged, the sooner we are able to you know, have things and, and, and have the world, have the planet, have the you know, our, our senses, have things back in, in a way that works as it did in early times. And and I've I've thought about that before. I'm one of these people who don't think that that's that that's a crime. And I think that you know, you do anything. I mean, you know, in, in a healthy way. But I don't believe that the sun causes cancer. Number one, well, I, I just don't believe that. You, I don't believe you need sunscreen. You melanin, if you don't have melanin to resist it. Uh -huh. Sorry. I, you know what? I've thought about that too, Barry, but I come down a little differently on that. I believe, because I believe that the sun is um, is primary um, to this planet, I'm not saying that you should just go out there and bake and burn up, but I believe that, I don't believe that all the sunscreens and all those chemicals to put, protect you from this, you don't need all of that. You know, and I think that no. anything you're melody, if it were the case, the amount of sun that people get, everybody would have sun, all these people have sun cancer. I mean, skin cancer. People don't have skin cancer at those at those rates any long, at all, really. I, I so, can't, go ahead. Do what I remember, right? The second cataclysm caused the firmament to fall. All right, those okay. heated, heated fragments that came back heated up the atmosphere and destroyed our firmament, all right? Then the firmament fell 
as an onslaught of rain, okay, a downpour, what we would okay. call biblically the big, the large, the, 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 the flood, okay? Okay. I'm no thing happened the way that I read in that book, all right? Not what I remember, all right? Anyway, <laughs> the firmament, <or> the <laughs> when the firmament fell, all right, the cosmic rays gained access to Earth because the firmament was kind of like an ocean between the atmosphere. And the right, cosmic exactly. rays immediately started shortening people's lifespans, the height of humans, all right? And if you look at it in term, a lot of us right now die from cancer, which no matter what form of it is little more than cosmic radiation exposure. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I was used to watch when those cats would go out in space, and I was wondering, you know, because I had found out a long time ago that the cosmic rays, they couldn't shield from it, and it destroys brain material like something like 2% every 72 hours or some amount of days, to the point of where if they go out in space for a couple of years, go and come back, they're going to be vegetables. Soon. Right. And the fact that I think space is pure melanin, and if you don't have any melanin to help assimilate it, I think it could be a problem that might drive you crazy. This so what do you think then from your early memory? You probably should turn a light on. I know we're going to get ready to wrap this up, but it's kind of getting dark. <laughs> I know early we turned the light off. But um, speaking, of, speaking of melanin, brother, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so based on, thanks a lot. Based on your early, I mean, on, on early memories, you talk about what, where, you know, where do the tribes fall then? I mean, like, you know, you know, where, you know, people who are not melanin dominant, what do they need to be doing at this point in time? If in fact, that's, the, that's part of the protection, you know what I'm saying? Protection from. from well, we were talking about a lot of the cosmic radiation. Um, that well, you, We got <laughs> into talking about this because we were talking more about um, the eye of Horus, black dot theory. You know, we we're kind of going back to some biblical type of notions and what have you. Um, familiar stories. Yeah, I, I mean, mean. You kind of, you introduced this. And so my question is that if you're not melanin dominant, are you saying that, uh, what are you exactly saying? I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm just, I was simply speaking that melanin, melanin as my ability to help me to access race, race memory. If you mean as far as the sun and lack of mem melanin, okay, memory, science yeah. shows that it burns them up. You can see that. I mean, and I, I think there's a certain amount of loss there because having melanin, we're actually getting information, gamma radiation, other things being interpreted by the sun. You know, mm -hmm. take right. this further, you know, like we've got a, you know, I noticed you did a show about the Quiche Foundation and it got a bunch of looks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I'm not real familiar with them outside of their anti-gravity and free energy technology, which is quite impressive, I think. A lot of people say it's fake. Well, prove it's fake. Anyway, anyway, um, they were looking into something. Keish was looking into something that's called radiotropic fungus, all right? And what that is, is that is fungus that was found in Chernobyl, all right? And, and sorry, not Chernobyl, uh, there too, but... Fukushima, especially Fukushima, Fukushima okay. in, the, in, 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 the, in the reactor. It's growing all on the walls. It's oh. a, black, a black sludge. A lot of people are telling me, is that the black goo? Is that the black goo? I said, no, that's not the black goo. That's something different. But what this radiotropic fungus is doing is, all right, <laughs> dig this. <laughs> it uses its melanin to convert gamma radiation into a food source a growth source okay what? yeah so basically it's growing in the radio in the radioactive broken reactor of fukushima where where only radio only robots can go in there and scrape it off the walls okay but it's growing wow. and quiche was doing something he was trying to do something that uses that to actually instead of the organisms that are creating eating like the radiation and leaving all the the droppings are just as bad. He's trying to use that to help revitalize um, contaminated places, radiation contaminated places. Right. I, don't, I don't know how far it's gotten from there, but I mean, for me, yeah. when I heard that about radiotropic fungus, I was like, man, tell me a little kid, but it reminds me of Bill Bixby and Lou Ferrigno. That's the Hulk, <laughs> man. The Hulk. The Hulk. I know. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, it's using it as a food source. Mm -hmm. Wow. With a growth cycle. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's crazy all, you know, um, all that we're, that is actually coming to the forefront, you know, that we get a chance to look at this stuff and sort of, you know, and, and, and sort of see where it fits in. I mean, you know, I mean, I think this is dynamic times to be living in. And if you just allow yourself to experience each day and each new piece of information and things that come in, you don't have to judge it one way or the other. Just experience it. Just listen, look at it because it's going to fall into its place. It reminds me of um, one of those big old locks that used to be on banks, you know, the big locks. And, you know, you put the combination <laughs> and as you turn it, all those tumblers will slowly fall into place. I mean, you know, and I think that's what's happening right now. I mean, you know, we're, it, things are tumbling and they're falling into place. And um, I think the biggest thing that I know that I do, I try not to draw a lot of conclusions one way or the other, unless I have a direct experience with it, direct memory, um, direct relationship, some sort of way. And even then that's my memory, my experience. It doesn't mean that that same thing serves you or serves the next person. And I think that that's why when we do shows like this and the idea of YouTube, people are doing all kinds of things on it. Every piece of information is not for everyone, you know, but you, you take it because we're all, um, we're vibrating at different frequencies. We have different soul paths. We have different memories. We have different whatevers. Mm -hmm. And what, you, what we may need, one person is different from the other. That's why I'm a big proponent, uh, uh, you know, a proponent of not saying this is the truth. That's not the truth. You know what I mean? You really don't know. All you know is what your personal truths are. And hopefully, um, you know, as we go down this road, we keep on finding those truths that line up with what it is we need to hear and be doing in this particular incarnation, you know, you know you and get an idea of, of what it is as a whole. You can take that. But um, we probably should be bringing it to the close. And I know we've talked for two hours now for sure. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's easy to do. And uh, I, I think looking at immortal souls, uh -huh. you know, we're facing boredom and all that. But one thing we can do when we're in the vicinity of another immortal soul, we can share that illusion. We can reinforce that illusion. All right. In which case we're dealing with a collective consciousness and we've got millions of immortal souls here in the same vicinity of each other, keeping this very grounded, keeping this third dimension very solid. You know what I mean? So it's right. a matter of breaking that to a certain degree. And that's by dealing with your awareness and dealing with your perception, your intent of will, like you said. You know, we describe dreams a little bit before we get done with this. I'll say, for me, and so many people now, these te different techniques, if you're like me, I tried one or two and it didn't yield immediate paranormal results. I said, forget it. I moved on to the next one. You know what I mean? Until I find one that immediately did something. But a lot of right. people, same way with even pla practicing telepathy. It doesn't work the first couple of times. They say F it and don't practice it anymore. It's like learning how to ride a bike. You don't just learn it. You've got to practice. Yeah, you have to. That's one thing I say, practice the techniques and keep trying it for dreaming. I had to practice that a lot and I'm still not good at it. I mean, I didn't have dream attention, which you call lucid dreaming, which means I was as corporeal there as I am here now. I had to learn how to do that. I had to right. change my normal life, like right here. And Castaneda talks about all that, you know, which is free up enough energy by acting different ways, meditating, praying, not doing routines, that freed up enough energy that when I fell asleep, I was becoming more lucid and gaining more dream attention. For you to use right. the class, I used the technique of looking at your hands. That was my first gate. You know how long right. it took me to do that? I said F it like 10 times before I actually <laughs> got enough energy to do it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know what you mean. Just don't give up. Stay with it because it's so hard taking care of our kids. It's so hard paying the bills, going to work, doing school. But don't give up. St keep trying to intend energy to your dream body. Keep right. trying intent a will to that that's how it starts by action and intending sorry i agree with you no no i'm glad you said that i mean that's a that's a perfect wrap up because um i agree with you 100 percent. and with that um i always you know just say be patient be patient with yourself you know we didn't get we it took us a long time to get to this place in time 
where we're willing to begin to break back down and look at these things. So, you know, it was a work in progress to get here at whatever point you are. And so it's about being patient in, you know, in your, you know, in your intent, um, you know, in, in taking and in, in focusing your, your, your intention in your will to do something. And the, I'm going to tell you the other thing, and I, I know people have said this a lot, and it goes like most people just say, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. But I'm going to tell you it's one thing that's worked incredibly well for me is to not say that I'm not good at doing the thing I'm trying to do. You know, when you, when you play that tape where it says, you know, I'm trying to lose a dream, but I can't. It's been seven days. I can't do it. Every time you say that can't, you bring yourself back to day one. All the work that you were doing in seven days, you're right back to that moment in time when you first tried to do it and you said, oh, this is not work. So, I mean, like, it's really just being mindful. It goes back to your intent. You know, you know, if you're holding something very heavy and it's starting to slip, what are you saying to yourself? You're saying, I'm going to grip it. I'm going to hold it. I'm going I'm, I'm to tighten down. I'm going to hold it. I'm gonna, I'm, you, you're not saying, oh, I'm going to let it go. It's going to fall. It's slipping. You know, because those intentions cause you to lose strength. It's when you say, I only got 30 more seconds to hold it like this. I got it. I'm t it's tight. I'm, it's firm. That's what causes you to get through that 30 seconds. Because <laughs> the minute you think you, you're going to drop it, you, you drop it. So it's a similar kind of concept, I think. Do you remember Empire Strikes Back, that movie? I don't know if you ever saw it. Yeah. But there's one point where he tells Luke to raise the ship out of the, out of the swamp. And he said, man, I'll try. He looked at him. He said, he said no. Do or do not. There is no try. And he exactly. Told you, yourself, that's why you keep failing. There you go. <laughs> Self-discipline. same thing. That's, you know? <laughs> exactly. I think uh, Deepak, he says that in one of his books. He says, you know, birds don't try to fly. They just fly. Mm -hmm. um, flowers don't try to grow. They just grow, you know? And it's a simple concept, but it's the same with, with us. You know, you don't try to do the thing, just do it. And then one day, you know, the flower starts growing. It's all the way down the ground somewhere, a seed, but it's still growing. You know, it's not till it goes through a space of time that it becomes that rose and all its brilliance and beauty. Um, mm -hmm. And so any of this stuff that we're talking about is a similar process. It'll take a period of time before you see the manifestation, but that whole time that it's going on, you're doing it. You're doing it. You're not trying to do it. It's in the process of happening, you know, and that's a big one for and, what we've been talking about. And if, as immortal souls, we can use matter and energy to create space or vice versa, same thing. That's through the intent. There's, we, don't have, we don't have hands in that position. We can only do it through will. Only yeah. way. Something that I we mean, can not because we can't remember fully what we are. Yeah, and it, and it's it's so true because I, I I don't think I shared this before on this show, but um, I remember uh, uh, maybe about five years ago now, and I was in those one of those places. I was kind of in between. I've always been self-employed, and um, you know I was in between those contracts, you know, and dollars were tight, you know, and I was like, I was kind of getting a little bit down that you know my money was really tight, and um, I was waiting for this contract to come in that was paying well and it was this particular day and I felt myself kind of trying to get ready to be depressed and I'm not one to really get depressed but I was feeling it so I decided I was going to just treat myself and just go out to this uh, I was living in DC at the time so I'm gonna go down to Middleburg Virginia I'm gonna walk around the little town it's a great little restaurant down there I'm just gonna do something special in this day and turn this day into something that's fun and joyful. And I focus on the fact I'm waiting this contract, the, the letters, I mean, the, the check ain't in the mail, blah, 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 blah. I don't have any money, da, 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 you know, whole thing. So I do that and it transports me, you know? So I'm in and out of little antique shops. I'm looking at stuff, you know, that's my little thing. I like that kind of stuff. And I went and, I, you know, I had maybe a $20 on me. I went and bought a nice little meal with uh, my glass of wine, and I just treated myself. So as I left out of there, I had gone into this antique store, and I was in there walking around. The only, the only the owner was in there, and I'm walking around looking. We chit-chat a little bit, and I leave out. Now, this was in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day. So it was, it was almost dead in Middleburg. It really wasn't anybody on the streets or anything. And I come walking out of his shop, 
And no one had come in or out the whole time I was in the shop. And I walk out, and there's like three $100 crisp bills laying right on the ground. They weren't folded. They were crisp, like newly minted. And I looked, and I thought, well, nobody came in, so they couldn't have dropped it. I look up the street. I look down the street. There is no one around. There's no one around. And I knew in that moment that I had manifested that money, you know, and I did it through joy and service, to, you know, you know, not focusing on it, treating myself, having a good time, going into joy, going into pleasure. And in that moment, I manifested what I needed. And I've done that several times. And I believe that that's what we're talking about in operation here. We're so busy thinking that in order to get resources, we have to do a certain thing. It only comes to us this particular way. But as we break out of those kind of formats and those constructs and begin to do what you were talking about, you know, consciously intend through will, this is how I'm going to be. I'm going to be happy today and I'm going to be okay financially. The end. And you start doing that, you move your world and things happen. So anyway, I want to share that. <laughs> Good story. Definitely. Definitely. So listen. A lot, a lot of people going to come out of here right now going, I'm trying to intend some will. I can already feel it right now. Oh, my yes, you know what? <laughs> guess what? If you do it like, if you just follow those, that story, you'll be surprised in the next 24 hours what will open to you. It is amazing. I'm gonna it, it, it happens every time. Yeah. So, um, but anyhow, Barry, thanks so much. I know it's time for you to probably get some food or something you've been working and then you, you know, we get on this show and uh, you probably need a, is, or a game or something's on. I know that, you know, something's getting ready to happen in your world that, you know, you got your downtime for. Last X-Files tonight, I might watch that. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, listen, thank you so much. I mean, I think we've, you know, we've touched a lot here. Uh, you know, for those of you who've stuck with us to the end, I know it could be a little convoluted, but so is the universe. You know, get used to it. <laughs> if you're going to get to anything, it seems like to learn what you need to learn, it's convoluted. You know, like you go around and up and about, but it always comes out. You always walk away with something, you know. So, again, thank you, Barry. Um, thank you. Thank you. I, th I thank you, and I thank everybody for listening and for having me back. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. You're a good interviewer. So, I like where we went. Well, this, this went. this went different than I thought it would, different topics. That's great. You but know, you know, you said that too, because when I reached, re first reached out to you and I saw it as a jumping off point and you were like, yeah, and then you got me back. You said, nope, I got the answer was yes. You know, we need to just do this. And we knew the spirit was going to take over. So I just trust that the people who hear this, they're, you know, that even through the sound, our intonation, our intention, our heart, our love space, you know, for what we're doing and for people on this planet, all of that becomes a part of the message. And uh, so people are gonna get just what they need to get out of this interview. And uh, again, thank you. I'll, I'm sure I'm gonna have you on again because now I wanna, um, I'm sure there's gonna be some more things that happen in my world that's gonna cause me to ask you different questions and just asking you a different question, a whole new quantum <laughs> part of your brain opens up and more comes spilling out. So I'm feeling that. So thanks again, Barry. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for having me and God bless you and everyone listening. Same thing. Take care. Bye-bye.